Welcome to this week's edition of Freedom and Prosperity Radio, the weekly radio news magazine we put together here at the Virginia Institute for Public Policy so that you can go into your conversations, especially as we start head- heading uh, back into a more normal routine in the September month and head towards uh, autumn with uh, the, the details. So when you get the narrative uh, like a president saying, no, the economy's great. Um, and then you go to the grocery store and wonder if maybe you're the crazy one. We'll give you some food for thought. Speaking of food, joining us to kick off this week's program, President and Chief Strategy Officer for the John Locke Foundation and a man who's been part of do teams like we call ourselves. I'm sure we're a think tank, but we're also a do tank. Donald Bryson is on uh, with us to kick off this week's program. We're going to talk a little bit about food freedom and the freedom to farm uh, uh, Donald, welcome back to the show. How are you doing, sir? Oh, I'm doing well. It's always uh, always a pleasure to talk to the smart people of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and uh, I just appreciate you having me on. Well, not at all, and uh, and we appreciate being called smart. Uh, but uh, I tell you, you know, you've been involved in the, this movement since pretty much the beginnings of the uh, Taxed Enough Already program. And pardon me if I sound parochial, but I feel like we've lost so much in these acronyms these days that uh, it remind people that that's what was going on in the late 2000s, early 2010s uh, there. Uh, and it, it, when it first got going, did you ever think we would swing this way? wildly uh, back into uh, a top-down authoritarian style, you know, almost bureaucracy state? Uh, I, I mean, I, I sincerely hope not. Uh, and, and I'm disappointed that we have. Uh, you know, I've uh, been talking with people over the past few months and I keep asking questions, you know, where are the power skeptics in, in any part of American politics right now? Where are those people that, uh, you know, I, I grew up, conservative. And, and I generally thought that to be conservative meant that I, I was uh, trying to conserve uh, American values and principles mm-hmm. and that I was skeptical of any large amassment of political power, whether that was in big government or big business or whatever. And now all I see are, you know, regardless of party, people just trying to make sure the other side doesn't have that power. And nobody's trying to, uh, you know, you know, dial down the power that the government has. Mm-hmm. It's almost what Madison was worried about and what really George Mason was worried about, uh, about these centralized offices and, and the natural uh, inclination of human nature. As soon as enough humans get together, they start thinking they're better than uh, somebody else and, and uh, Johnny bar the door. Uh, Donald, especially the power of America being its agriculture and our ability to feed the uh, I would argue if we really put our heads together and, and farmed as hard as we could, we could probably feed the world from the garden that is uh, the agricultural bounty in the United States, coast to coast. And, and yet, you know, we're struggling with that. Is it the farm bill or is it harder than that than to you know point to one place where our, our farming has kind of fallen by the wayside? Well, there, there are a lot of things going on and, you know, while inflation year over year, as of the August report, is 8.3%. That's the broader consumer price index. If you look at just food, mm-hmm. uh, as of August, you know, food inflation is 11.4%. Food at home, mm-hmm. which is you know food you go buy at the grocery store and you bring home and you eat it at home, that's 13.5% year over year, which is... Uh, I mean, that's dramatically above what the current inflation, overall inflation rate is. And, you know, that's bad enough. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, people are, you know, talking about gas prices going down and inflation's not so bad here. People are spending more based on the consumer reports, but they're spending more because when they go to the grocery store, they're having to spend more. And there are a lot of reasons to do with that. Uh, but, uh, you know, Margaret Thatcher, former prime minister, uh, of Great Britain said it best. Inflation is caused by governments. Mm-hmm. I think, as as you know, conservatives or libertarians, however we want to talk about ourselves, classic liberals, uh, we talk about inflation and we automatically talk about Fed and the Fed and the Fed is putting too much money in the economy and the federal government is spending too much money. All of those things are true, but other things can drive inflation as well, such as 
government policies that make sure that, you know, when we grow food, we're not eating the food. We're using it for other purposes like biodiesel and ethanol mm-hmm. or uh, there are uh, log jams in supply chain because government regulations have made it to where only basically four major meat processors you know, process all of the meat in all of the United States. Well, when those processing plants for those only four companies become hot spots for COVID, we have a strange thing where grocery stores are, um, uh, you know, have, have a lack of mm-hmm. meat and dairy and eggs uh, in their, uh, on their shelves. But at the same time, uh, farmers are having to euthanize cows and pigs and chickens because there's just no processing plant for them to go to. And that's the part I think people don't realize is the supply chain that began with not even hot spots of COVID, but just restrictions on some of these manufacturing plants just to have you know, their employees pared down by, in some cases, two thirds. Uh, I, I think Smithfield was saying that. But then you, you also mentioned the centralization. Uh, much is made about uh, the Chinese government's ownership stake in Smithfield. Um, and this centralization right. creates so much fragility agility in all of our supply chains, but especially dire, uh, is the food. Is is there a movement afoot to, you know, go back to local, um, you know, I know a lot of folks talk about farmers markets, but uh, often these are folks who are just uh, bringing stuff that they haven't sold to a, to a Smithfield, not picking on just them, but, or a, or a uh, Mount Air Farms or a Purdue. There, there are, there, there absolutely is sort of this thing to uh, you know, you see a lot of buy local, and we've saw and seen that for a long time. But now, buying local seems to be sort of the free market approach, uh, and and so uh, we're seeing this rise in small family organic farms setting up their own farm stands or going to local farmers markets uh, and providing you know higher quality food at a cheaper price than you know what we're seeing at the grocery store and what the national supply chain is able to provide us right now. Uh, unfortunately, in some states. Uh, we're seeing increased regulation preventing people from actually getting their product to market. The federal government obviously has mucked up uh, agriculture in a variety of ways. I think when um, people say agriculture, and you, and particularly when you say federal government and agriculture, all they think about are subsidies, and, and the subsidies are bad enough. But then there's this additional layer of regulation right. and incentivizing people to to use food for other things. I'm, I mean, when 40 percent of uh, soybeans in the United States are being used for biodiesel. That's 40% of soybeans grown in the United States that aren't going into food products. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, we had competing headlines back in June. It was one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen. And I never saw anybody in the press pick up on it, but the Biden administration wanted to, uh, increase the renewable fuel standard, the federal, uh, uh renewable fuel standard to help ease off on oil prices at the same time. The UK and Germany were saying they were going to ease off on their uh, renewable energy mandates uh, for uh, for petrol, as they would say, uh, so that they could ease off on food prices. Right. <laughs> and so they're, they're major economies are doing opposite things with the same thing. And, you know, we shouldn't treat farmers as sort of the pressure valve on food prices and oil or and, you know, uh, fuel prices at the same time. Right. Uh, it, it is a bizarre bizarre circumstance that we're in and then there are state policies that go on top of that that in that in, you know, prevent farmers from selling at local farmers markets they also incentivize farmers to make more biodiesel or ethanol and things like that and it's just it's driving up food prices dramatically Donald Bryson is on with us from the John Locke Foundation on this week's Freedom and Prosperity Radio. Now, uh, you know, there are competing stories and and a lot of, you know, the social media gets picked up with farmers being paid to destroy their food, to 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 uh, uh, bury under. How much of that was a narrative that was picking up on things that, uh, you know, go back to the 30s and the farm bill to try to keep food prices at a point where uh, farmers aren't losing money for the acreage they uh, plow and artificially keep the food prices up to a point where farmers can uh, afford. We watched the same thing with the oil industry. When barrels of oil got under $50 a barrel, American oil producers said, we can't afford this anymore. And the Saudis could crank it out because their you know line workers were ostensibly slave labor. Um, so, you know, it, w- how much of that is, is legit versus, um, you know, just things that have been going on since the 30s and 40s? 
Well, it, it was legitimate uh, during, you know, I, I guess we'll call it high COVID okay. <laughs> in 2020 or 2021, uh, but in, in a bizarre sort of way. So the, the, the USDA has created regulations um, as, as such that it makes it basically impossible for small to medium processors uh, to uh, sell their, you know, and I mean meat processors, to sell mm-hmm. Uh, across state lines and you can pass state regulations or, or, you know, you can get through state regulations and sell within the state, but selling across state lines is impossible basically without somebody from the USDA being planted at your plant and, and looking at it all the time. Uh, and of course the four major meat processors in the country have created those regulations in such a way that that happens. That's okay until a global pandemic comes along and shuts things down an awful lot. What we saw, and you, know, you can Google this and see just these tragic pictures of hundreds and thousands of cows and chickens and hogs uh, being euthanized on the farm because uh, there are diminishing returns to the farmer mm-hmm. after a while. You know, After you have a grown hog, it's not going to grow anymore, but you have to continue to feed it to keep it alive. Uh, and they couldn't afford to just continue to feed these hogs indefinitely. The reason that they were going to have to feed them indefinitely was because there was no meat supply plant for them to go to. Right. Uh, one of those USDA plants. And so they had to euthanize them and, you know, bring in the next crop of pigs. But what if, uh, you know, there was uh, a rule in, you know, between, let's say, Virginia and North Carolina so that they would each recognize uh their state's uh Mm -hmm. inspections for meat processing and that way you could get around the usda stuff and but the states themselves would control interstate commerce between those two states that's something that we're talking about at the john locke foundation we did a study last year uh, uh called freedom to farm where we looked at meat and dairy regulations across seven southern states including virginia and north carolina kentucky georgia south carolina uh florida uh was in that as well and so when you think about small you know, cattle productions, uh, you know, mm. you know, you know two fewer than 50 cows, or fewer than 10 cows, which, by the way, in Virginia, you know, 18% of cattle operations in Virginia have fewer than 20 cows. That's right. a lot of farmers in Virginia. Uh, and so, you know, how do we get them to small? Can, can we create a, a sort of this uh, atmosphere so that they can get their own small and medium meat production and sell to people in Virginia mm-hmm. or sell to people in West Virginia or North Carolina. Uh, and that way that would alleviate a lot of these supply chain issues that we're still sort of kind of suffering from. Is there also a supply chain issue, and, and certainly in our flagship area of Charlottesville, uh, the cattle industry, uh, those small cattle farms are prevalent or, around. Um, you know, is there a supply chain issue on the processing, uh, you know, butchering uh, of that you know, livestock that, you know, if you're not sending it to Smithfield, then can you can you call the local butcher and have it taken care of? It was a bizarre event about five, six years ago in Virginia where the General Assembly could Conservatives in the General Assembly proudly told me that they had uh, passed a law that allowed farmers to sell the products from their farm on their farm. And I, and I looked at one of them and I said, you needed to pass a law that gives somebody the right to sell a tomato that they grew on their farm. And they said, well, we're just trying to protect the consumer. And I said, how, how, it, it, it just I, I guess maybe we've just developed the nanny state to that point. Yeah, it, we we definitely have developed the, the nanny state to that point. It, it's it, it's really bizarre. Uh, the USDA again uh, really hamstrings states an awful lot in that because um, honestly, it's you know federal law says that state regulations have to be at least on par with federal regulations, and so a lot of states have just given up. You know, if we got to go with USDA regulations anyway, we may as well just let the USDA do it and not worry about it. I think states need to start pushing back on that because it's really caused uh, an an awful lot of problems. But chickens are a really good example uh, of what I'm talking about uh, with this. You know, if you look at the rules for poultry processing, uh, and these are federal rules, right? The the feds make up um, a 1,000 bird exemption where you can slaughter uh, and sell on your property or 20,000 bird exemption. Now, there are a lot of reasons why there are 20,000 birds or 1,000 birds, and states can opt into those, you know, either both of those or, or one or the other of those. Looks like Virginia ha- has opted into both of those. But that means that, you know, I could kill 20,000 chickens on my property in Virginia or North Carolina and then sell them. But if I kill 20,000 in one birds, suddenly 
all those chickens are, you know, something like a controlled substance, right? That's, mm-hmm. that's bizarre. Uh, we don't treat, you know, meth like that. We don't treat cocaine like that. It's either bad or it's not bad. Right. But something about that, you know, 20,000 and first bird. Oh my gosh, we've called the USDA in. I might be going to jail. Am I selling stuff that's unsafe? Uh, and, and it's kind of a strange thing, but it's very clear that, uh, you know, this is one of those things where industry has gotten in, uh, in bed with government and created this state of regulatory capture where they capture the market by regulating their competition out of there. Uh, and that brings back to our earlier conversation of, you know, where are the power skeptics? Uh, but the problem is, you know, we see this with uh, a lot of things like uh, the tech industry right now. We're seeing this with agriculture where, um, you know, the power, the political power of big business and the political power of the federal government and even the state government have come together, and it's really caused a problem for the free market. Well, it's, it, it reminds me of Hoffer's paradigm where, you know, movement becomes business, becomes racket, and, and that, you know, agriculturally, I'm sure at one point protecting the consumers from uh, slipshod butchering and that kind of thing might have been a thing, but eventually you know, it, it gets to the point where only the biggest butchering companies can even do it anymore so your your local guy isn't going to uh, help slaughter a bunch of cattle and then sell the meat right there at the farmers market right that's a great point <laughs> so so that's you, a great point. so at the lock foundation you started a food freedom um, uh, team. It's uh, the Center for Food Power and Life. Uh, you know what? What is the, the the membership in that right now? And and what are you guys up to? Well, uh, you know, we we created that Center for Food Power and Life because it, as strange as it may seem, it's increasingly difficult to separate the issues of agriculture and energy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and for a lot of reasons, you know, that I've talked about right now, uh, John Sanders is the center director. He's done regulatory studies for the John Locke Foundation for several years. And that seemed like a natural marriage for him and for us, for him to sort of take over this new center and, and really get at the heart of, you know, where are we going with how we power our homes and how we feed the people in our homes? Mm-hmm. And, and so we're, we're really excited about the prospects and that. We're still going around talking about our study uh, again, if people want to go to johnlock.org and check it out, it's called Freedom to Farm, uh, and we do you know regulatory comparison for meat and dairy processing in seven southern states, including Virginia. Uh, but next, you know, we're going to start looking at how do we sort of bring, you know, make federalism great again? How do we bring the power of the states back mm-hmm. to, uh, uh, back to uh, the you know the, the state house, uh, back to the general assembly of each state? So that we can you know, get this out of the federal government and come up with food solutions that work for North Carolina and work for Virginia and work for South Carolina, rather than you know somebody in D.C. Uh, you know trying mm-hmm. to come up with regulations that just don't work. I mean, there's a great quote uh, from President Eisenhower, in which you know Eisenhower, I mean he's he's literally uh, <laughs> big government, you know, having run the military and then he was president. But he, he uh, had a great quote that he gave a speech on uh, in Bradley College back in 1956, uh, where he talked about and said, farming looks mighty easy when you, uh, your plow is a pencil and you're a thousand miles from the cornfield. <laughs> and I think that's exactly where we're finding ourselves right now. Well, and, and you look about and you mentioned energy and agriculture and you've talked about you know, diverting so much of our agriculture to creating energy. But then at the other end of the plow uh, or the cow, uh, it, it comes the regulation on our natural gas, which sounds like, you know, oh, we're, we're cutting back on you know, that fossil fuel until you realize how much of that goes into agriculture. I had no idea until I talked to some farmers about how much they're fertile costs were going. So it's not just the meat processors, but now we're seeing uh, the, the regular agri businesses being struck with massive increases uh, in sometimes doubling the cost of their fertilizer. Right. And, and there are two things that, that go into that as well. There's the cost of natural gas, but then there's also sort of the energy security. Of it. We need natural gas. You know, we can let's set aside the debate about climate change and all that. We have to have natural gas 
uh, in order to fuel our economy. And even, you know, if you want to move to a carbon free or carbon neutral environment, we're not going to go all wind and solar tomorrow. It's just not going to happen. It's not reasonable. The science isn't there. Uh, and so natural gas is that transition fuel. Uh, but, you know, if you look at a state like North Carolina, we're, we're the ninth largest state in the country, and we have one major natural gas line that fuels the entire state. Uh, that, that's not good. That's not reasonable. Right. Uh, but, you know, the Mountain Valley Pipeline um, is coming out of West Virginia through Virginia and into North Carolina. And, of course, you know, people are fighting at the federal level and at the state level all the way. But we need that natural gas. At the same time, farmers are still having to, you know, run diesel through their tractors and their combines and things like that. But increasing amounts of that diesel are coming from, uh, you know, well, the gasoline's coming from ethanol or then you have biodiesel from soybeans, which is a strange sort of thing, you know, you're using soy diesel in order to harvest soybeans. It's kind of like taking a power cord and plugging it into itself and not understanding why you don't have infinite power. We've seen some stunning statistics, uh, Donald, uh, about the number of farmers at all uh, per capita in the United States and, and how that number has dropped. What kind of, you know, and there's a myriad of fingers pointing at, you know, whether it's estate taxes, that kind of thing, that keep family farms from staying family farms, that regulatory capture drives them uh, into these associations and it just loses the individuality of the family farmer uh, to the point where that's a, almost a dying breed of them themselves. Uh, talk about addressing that and getting more people farming again. Well, uh, you know, that's a really great point. And farming is a great and, and no profession. I say that as somebody who uh, grew up farming. Uh, and, and we need more farmers, we need more food producers, and we need specifically more domestic food producers here in the United States. Um, the state taxes, particularly the federal estate tax, uh, does crush, absolutely crush family farms. You know, my father dies and he leaves me, uh, you know, let's say 300 acres to farm on. Well, <laughs> you know, I'm taxed at 20% on the value of, of that property or whatever the percentage is. And that's just absolutely crushing. Imagine trying to go out and buy 300 acres somewhere, anywhere in your North Carolina oh, right now. Uh, and, and that's just an astronomical amount of money. Even if you think about just 20% of it, I have to come up with that right now. No, I don't have it. Right. Uh, and so people end up just selling the family farm. Even if they're able to stay and maintain the farm, there's increased uh, regulations, increasing environmental regulations. Now we've got the SEC coming in, uh, you know, the Securities and Exchange Commission, not the Southeastern Conference, <laughs> coming in uh, and, and trying to, you know, if you're a large enough farm, you're going to have to start uh, you're reporting what you're trying to do to mitigate, uh, uh, you know, emissions from your right. farm equipment and, and, and have a clean environment and that sort of thing. And that's a backwards way of looking at farming. Farmers are incentivized to keep, you know, the, the water quality and the air quality high on their farm. Exactly. Because they own it and they need it to continue to produce. And right. so to think that farms were, farmers are going to come out and, you know, just, you know, pour diesel all over their property and let it run off and increase <laughs> the water their cattle right. out of, that's just, that's unreasonable. And it's an unrealistic understanding of how farming works. I was listening, I think it was a week, maybe two weeks ago, and uh, some of the Green Agenda folks were talking about, uh, uh, and it may have been in their uh, agenda towards what 2050 is going to look like. And they said, well, necessarily one of the things they, one of their goals is a 40% reduction in how much people are consuming in food. Now, I don't know if that's going to be achieved in just 40% fewer of us, as uh, uh, we were told by the anthropologist, or um, or if they just expect all of us to eat less uh, and accept less, uh, because I think at the end, we're, we're pushing the green agenda to a point where where they're admitting uh, that it's a population control uh, thing and um, and and a wealth of nations uh, redistribution and uh, the greedy countries like the United States need to stop eating so much because there's poor countries in Africa that are hungry uh, and and so much of that I think impacts the farmers as well and there are some real points in there but really let's grow the agriculture in other parts of the world rather than just demonizing a 
American and Canadian agriculture. No, and I think you, you hit the, the nail on the head there. There was a meme that came out uh, when, uh, you know, as, as the youths make the memes, uh, there, there was a meme that came out a couple of years ago. It says, you are the carbon they want to reduce. And uh, scarily, that seems to be more and more the case that, you know, well, we just need fewer people. Well, gosh, what are the implications of that? And what does that mean? The truth is we can continue to produce uh, plenty of food to feed all the people in the world mm -hmm. with what we've got. The, the problem is, is that we keep falling all over ourselves to figure out ways to prevent people from producing that food. Um, and, you know, that's not unique to the United States. Um, you know, regulations and taxes uh, on agriculture and businesses all over the world uh, are becoming a problem. And then you add in layers of you know, international agreements like the climate agreements with the UN and it becomes more and more difficult. There was a great, actually, uh, article in the Wall Street Journal that came out last December, I believe, and I would encourage people to go to it. It's the COP26 plan to keep Africa poor. Uh, and it's a lady who runs a think tank and she's an entrepreneur, uh, I believe in Nigeria talked about how it's unreasonable for you know all the white people to get together in Scotland with the UN and then tell Africa that they have to stop using biomass to heat their homes and cook their food right and her larger point is look you know we're at the continent of 1.2 billion people 90 percent of us use biomass to just cook our food and now you're saying stop that but you're not giving us any sort of transition time or telling us what to do it uh, it's not reasonable uh, you know, going back to sort of that President Eisenhower quote of, you know, when you're going to talk about agriculture and food production, and food systems, the closer to the problem, the closer to the situation you can be, the better. But people sitting in Scotland certainly don't understand, you know, what it takes to feed people uh, in Zimbabwe. I remember learning uh, back in, and albeit to be fair, the New York City public school system about the law of conservation of matter, and especially as it applied to the watershed on the planet, and you know that there's always going to be that amount of water. It's just where is it, uh, and that the irrigation really becomes the key liberating force. If you can get irrigation, I think the the ancient Egyptians figured that one out, and in the Israelis are particularly great at irrigating land that don't necessarily look like they'd be habitable or far farmable. Uh, and all of a sudden, you've got lush agriculture and, and people don't even realize when we talk about places like Israel that uh, it's it's this green garden in the middle of, of rocks and desert. Uh, and, and I think that should be the message for all of us, don't you, uh, Donald? I, I think that's right. And prosperity, and we're in favor of freedom and prosperity for everyone and everywhere. That's not a cry from the world government or the federal government or anything like that. It's saying, let's try to get out of the way of, of people in their local communities. Let's get out of the way of people. Because at the end of the day, that's what public policy is about. It's about improving people's lives. Uh, and, and I feel like we just lose some of that. And, you know, yeah. if you're a uh, government bureaucrat, generally speaking, you can't help but put it JohnLock.org is the uh, website. Donald uh, Bryson is their president and chief strategy officer. I appreciate your uh, busy, you know, um, improving people's lives. Unfortunately, I, I think there's a very small list of lives that government has decided they want to improve the uh, lot of, and uh, the rest of us sort of are just there uh, to uh, provide the, the capital for it. Uh, I appreciate everything. Visit JohnLock.org. Uh, and thank you for joining us this week on Freedom and Prosperity Radio. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Coming up next, Gabrielle Hoffman uh, with Young Voices, and she's going to talk about uh, sharpening the writing and media skills, especially as we get into the world of the citizen journalists next on Freedom and Prosperity Radio. Freedom and Prosperity Radio.